Good Nerev Shabbos, Gemarach Simat Our very brief Torah portion this week contains two mitzvahs. We're nearing the end of the Torah, so these are, in fact, the last two mitzvot that the Torah tells us. One of them is to gather together the entire Jewish people after the sabbatical year to hear the Torah read, and the other is for each Jew to write a Sefer Torah. These mitzvot bring us together and give us our reason for being together. Our daily halacha review, which you can find on our website, has a short video each day with a few points of Jewish law. Lately, we've been discussing Maimonides' listing of 613 mitzvot, Rambam's Sefer HaMitzvot. In his listing, the Rambam puts these two mitzvot very early on. They're actually numbers 16 and 18 in the section of positive mitzvot. But they are indeed the last two that the Torah itself mentions, the final instructions of Moshe Rabbeinu before he concludes his teaching to us before his life came to a close, and before our time in the desert came to a close, just before we entered into the Promised Land. Let's take a moment to reacquaint ourselves with these two commandments. The first of the two, Hakel, is contained in the words of Deuteronomy, chapter 31, verse 12, where it says, Hakel es ha'am, gather the people together, anashim v'anashim v'hataf, men, women, and children, v'ger ha'asher b'sharecha, the convert who's in your cities, Leman Yishma'u Uleman Yilmadu, so that they can hear and they can learn. Vayiru es Hashem Malakechem, there will be an awe of God, your God. Vishamru Lasas as Kol Divrei Hatara Azais. They'll be careful to keep all the words of Torah. A few verses before this indicate that it's to be uh, on Sukkot in the year following the sabbatical year. This year that we've just entered with Rosh Hashanah earlier this week is in fact a sabbatical year. So Hakel is to take place just a year and a week from now. And it is the king of Israel who is to read the Torah to the people, all the people. It's noteworthy that this mitzvah of being together, being part of this gathering of the entire Jewish people in Jerusalem, applies to every Jew. It is a positive time-bound mitzvah from which women are exempt in many cases, not all. Uh, here it clearly says that women are part of the assembly. Children under bar and bat mitzvah are not counted in a minion, nor are they directly responsible for mitzvot until they re reach majority. Yet here the verse clearly says children have to be there also. Hakel, this gathering together, was quite a spectacular moment. They prepared a platform for the king in the middle of the courtyard of the Temple of Jerusalem. The gabai would take a sefer Torah and hand it to the nasi, who would hand it to the deputy high priest, who would hand it to the kohen gadol, the high priest who would hand it to the king, who then took it and read selected passages to the people. Who was there? Everyone. There were scholars who knew the Torah very well, and there were people who couldn't even understand Hebrew probably. But they all experienced this gathering together. It was a moment of rejoicing, trembling, awe, like the experience of receiving the Torah at Mount Sinai. It was solely meant to strengthen our faith. Maimonides explains in Mishnah Torah, which is a longer and more detailed book on Jewish law, the Yerushalmi, the Jerusalem uh, Talmud, tells that Rabbi Yeshua's mother used to take him in his cradle to the base medrash, to the house of study, so that he would hear Torah being learned, even as a baby. So this notion of merit to parents who try to imbue Torah in their children, even from the youngest age, had special resonance for him, for Rabbi Yeshua. The Ishbitzer men, Rebbe mentions the, the phrase in Pirkei Avos that it says about the very same Rabbi Yeshua, happy is the mother that gave birth to him. A mother and father's desire that Torah enter the ears of their child, even though the child's too young to understand on the face of it, is a great tikkun for the midos of a person. <coughs> Pardon me. If we have blemishes or rough edges, this desire has the power to bring about repair. The Radatz, Rabbi David Zvi Hoffman, was the Rosh Hashiva in Berlin. <coughs> Excuse me. He passed away just short of 100 years ago. He noted that in every other year, Sukkot means harvest time, and the end of the work year for the farmers. Every year, except the year after Shemitah, the sabbatical year, because the farmer has not been working all summer to tend and harvest his crops. The land could lay fallow, so farmers were not working, so Sukkot is different, has a different feel after a Shemitah year. It's a reminder of how things were in the desert when everything was taken care of us, and people were ready to receive the Torah anew. <clears throat> Kli Yakar, who was the Rav in Prague in the 1600s, says that after the Shemitah year, the different classes of rich and poor have sort of been equalized. So this is the best time to have 
a hakel, an assembly, among the Jewish people with a true sense of unity. He explains further that bringing the kids to hakel, even if they can't understand what's happening, makes an impression on them, but even more, it makes an impression on the adults. Whether or not you're bringing your kids is less important <coughs> excuse me, than seeing kids at hakel. You see before your eyes what we're all davening for, that the future generations will be connected to Klal Yisrael, the collective unity of the Jewish people. Think of how meaningful that is, especially in this corona era where we have not had a kids program. And we really haven't been bringing, been bringing kids to shul for quite some time. That should bother us, because what we pray for and what we work for is the future of the Jewish people, and children are it, obviously. Hopefully by next year, a year from now, we'll experience our own hakel, we'll bring all the kids in the community back to shul. Aye, that was our hope last year, that by this year everything would be fine, but this year we really mean it and expect it. I mean, come on. The other mitzvah in Parshas Vayelech is the mitzvah of writing a Sefer Torah. Verse 19 says, Now write for yourselves this song, and teach it to the children of Israel, place it in their mouths, so that this song will be a witness to B'nai Yisrael for me, says God. Ideally, best case scenario, each of us writes a Sefer Torah for ourselves. Imagine you have to copy it over, learn all the laws of safras, of writing, and spend time writing out a Sefer Torah perfectly with not one letter missing or out of place. I'm told for a sofer, a trained scribe who's already expert in the laws of each letter and their placement in the entire Torah scroll, it's about a year's work. So probably not so practical for each of us to learn how to do it, although that's the best. So what's next best? Commissioning the writing of a Torah. Have someone hire someone to write it for you. Or buy one that an expert sofer has already written. 40, 50,000 US. Remember, this is a whole year's work. Or buy a used one. 10, 15,000, maybe a little bit more. Okay, for those of us who are still paying tuition to put these words in the mouths of B'nai Yisrael, that sounds like a lot. How about a printed Torah? An art scroll chumash or other such? We say that can fit the bill. Once upon a time, they sold them at Costco, but they're still available for not too much money from your favorite bookseller, Jewish or otherwise. Again, if you buy a chumash and put it on the shelf, you have definitely engaged this requirement of the mitzvah, acquiring a Sefer Torah. But ask yourself, do I know it as well as if I had written the whole thing out by hand from the beginning, Bereshis, to the end? Probably not. So how about making use of it? That's been a blessing of the COVID era all the time you want on Shabbos, and even during the week, to go through the Parsha, to notice carefully the wording, read the notes, ask questions, look things up, attend shiurim, attend other shiurim, think deeply, and make it your own. The idea behind writing it is to learn it. So you can see that, uh, let's say, when there's a bar mitzvah boy, right, the first thing we have him do, not is uh, to write a Sefer Torah, but we have him read, study from the Sefer Torah, even for one aliyah. At least to read a little bit out of the Sefer Torah. He's not going to write one for himself right away. Rabbi Weinrib, our friend who has visited the, our shul on occasion, tells a beautiful story uh, connected to this mitzvah of writing a Sefer Torah. He was a graduate student in the 1960s, and he agreed to teach a class to the local Jewish community near Washington, D.C., where he lived. The class was called The Last Mitzvah of the Torah. He designed the curriculum based on this verse that we're discussing. Now you should write for yourselves this song. It should teach it to the children of Israel. It should be a witness eternally. Decades later, he writes, he met up in Israel with four of the students of the class who had eventually gone on Aliyah, moved to Israel. They each shared with him something they had taken away from their study together so many years ago. One was a musicologist and found wonderful inspiration in the Torah being called a song. Another had very little Jewish background but resolved to make up for lost time. Still another was intrigued by the ideas he encountered in the class and went on to earn himself a doctorate in biblical history, wrote books on the subject. Rabbi Weinrib explained that they were living out what he had always believed, that a teacher has no idea how far-reaching the results of a class will be or what the impact ultimately will be on students. We do our best to engage people with good ideas and the wisdom of our people, and it helps people navigate their own lives. There's no telling where it will end. Now that we've entered into a new year, and we're about to enter into the Shabbat between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, which is called Shabbat Shuvah, 
Let's do some shuva. Let's go come back to and revisit some of our resolutions from earlier in the year or maybe earlier in our lives and pick up where we left off. Some of us have taken the time, as we mentioned, to make the most out of the quiet Shabbatot, to read the Torah portion deeply and thoughtfully. All of us could make more time for that in the new year. So even as we are in the time of gathering together, seeing that in most years, this one accepted, generally Jews make every effort to be in shul for the high holidays. This year, of course, is an exception. So we have worries about our health. So we're supporting and we're encouraging those who want to come to shul, and we are supporting and encouraging those who want to stay home and daven privately this year. So it is the time of gathering together, and it's also the time for writing ourselves the book of our year to come. There's one view that says the book of life metaphor, which is so prevalent this time of year. That's what we're wishing someone when we say, Gemar Simatova, that the sealing in the book of life should be a good one. One view says that it's we who choose to write our names in the book of life. That's an entirely worthwhile and valuable project for today and for this time between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur to dedicate ourselves and to actually start learning at the level of intensity we desire, we aspire to. The saying is attributed to more than one thinker, but the sentiment is a good one. It's never too late to become the person you might have been. So let's all take inspiration from that. Now, this Erev Shabbos, or this Shabbat day itself, let's begin anew. The special of Torah that we read, the Shabbos between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, begins, Shuva Yisrael Ad Hashem Alekecha, Return, O Israel, to God your God. We take uh, from three of the briefer prophetic books from Hosea, from Yoel and from Micha, each with a passage of tshuva, shofar sounding, forgiveness, all very pertinent to these days. The last section from Micha is also what we said when we stood at the water's edge on Rosh Hashanah for Tashlich. That's actually where the word comes from. It's just three verses, that section. But the point is strong. It says, Who, O God, is like you, who pardons iniquity and overlooks transgression for the remnant of his heritage? who has not maintained his wrath, for he desires kindness. Here's the key. He will again be merciful to us. He will suppress our iniquities. He will cast into the depths of the sea all of our sins. Grant truth to Yaakov, kindness to Abraham, as you promised our ancestors from ancient times. Dover Shalom comments that from the depths of the sea to the depths of the sea is where things that thrive on land usually don't fare so well. We're asking that not only the transgressions to be covered, uh, not only the transgressions to be covered over, but also that they be prevented from taking root and spreading their negative influence. Now, on the flip side of taking root and growing and producing fruit, since this year that we've just entered into is a Shemitah year, it's worth us, it's worthwhile for us to review just a little bit what the sabbatical year means for us living in Toronto and how it relates to our people living and especially those farming in the land of Israel. As the Torah mandates, the land of Israel is to lie fallow once every seven years. And this new year, 5,782, is just such a Shemitah year. It's a sabbatical year for the land of Israel. We need a break every seven years. No question about it. Your doctor will tell you, tell you your ophthalmologist will tell you, six days is the max. Then you have to take a break. You have to power down your screens, turn off your email alerts. You have to take your mind off work. If you don't, you're not going to do well the next week. You need a break. So thankfully, we have Shabbos to get us to do all that and more. And the Torah instructs us that the land also needs a Shabbos. At the beginning of Parsha's Bahar, chapter 25 of Leviticus, we have the clearest explanation of the mitzvah of Shemitah, letting the land lie fallow once every seven years. It says there in chapter 25 of Vayikra, God spoke to Moses at Mount Sinai telling him, to speak to the Israelites and say to them, when you come to the land that I am giving you, the land must be given a sabbatical, a Shabbat to God. For six years you may plant your fields, prune your vineyards, and harvest your crops. But the seventh year is a Sabbath, Sabbaths for the land. It's God's Shabbat, during which you may not plant your fields, nor prune your vineyards. Do not harvest crops that grow on their own, and do not gather the grapes on your unpruned vines since it is a year of rest for the land. What grows while the land is resting may be eaten by you, by your male and female servants, by the employees and resident hands who live with you. That's the end of the quote. That's verses 1 through 6. The mitzvah is mentioned in other places in the Torah as well, but this is the fullest expression of the mitzvah. So how does this work? Really, just as the verses say, 
this last Tuesday, Rosh Hashanah, began a year of Shemitah in Israel. So a Jew is biblically prohibited from planting, from harvesting, or even pruning any produce in the land of Israel. Rabbinically, that's extended to fertilizing the land, preparing it for being planted, as well as eating anything that was uh, planted or harvested, or even annual plants like vegetables that sprouted on their own during the Shemitah year. If there was incidental growth from perennials, trees, and plants that grow on their own, this produce is permitted. Now, the produce of Israel always has a status of holiness. That's why we have to take tithes from any Israeli produce that we buy or ensure that it has a reliable kosher supervision that did that for us. That's a concern all the time. But the Kedusha of Shavis, the Kedusha, the sanctity of the seventh year, has an added dimension. All the produce of Israel grown in the seventh year has this additional level of sanctity from the sabbatical year as well. Shemitah produce is not supposed to be taken outside of Israel, so it's less likely, but not impossible, that you'll encounter it in the markets in Toronto. The concern with buying Shemitah produce, or one of the concerns, is that the money that's used in the transaction to purchase it also attains the status of a sanctity, the holiness of the, of the Shemitah year, the sabbatical year. So we want to try to avoid that. Furthermore, we have to treat the produce with an added measure of care. The peels of fruits that are edible, like cucumber skins, apple cores, are not allowed to be thrown away. They have to be set aside until they begin to rot. Only then can they be discarded. Inedible peels, you're allowed to discard straight away. It's worth noting that although the Torah does give specific instruction for the Shemitah year, it's considered by many opinions to be a rabbinic mitzvah, mitzvah from Rabbanan nowadays, on several accounts, namely that there's no temple currently standing in Israel, more specifically a Jewish Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin, and the majority of the Jewish people do not live in Israel. This may be subject to change, so you'll no doubt see discussion about it in the global distribution of uh, Jewish population and how it does or doesn't affect Shemitah. And since uh, this mitzvah is cons widely considered to be a rabbinic one, that allows it to be counterbalanced with other concerns, like, for example, preservation of life. Think back 75 or 100 years ago when the world economy was much smaller, and if you didn't grow crops, you didn't eat. In those days, the heter mechira was devised, a method of selling the land for the period of the Shemitah year and allowing non-Jews to work the land and grow the produce. This is, of course, problematic from the point of view that it is prohibited to sell or give away any of the land of Israel to non-Jews. Hashem gave it to us. How can we possibly give it away? However, this mechanism has been in place for more than a century. There's also an Otsar Beit Din system in place that allows for consumption of some of the produce through ownership and sort of a corporate entity that's not subject to the prohibitions of working the land. That corporation can hire the farmers as its agents to perform the permitted labors on its behalf. Yet another solution to this uh, quandary involves hydroponic farming. The produce is never grown in the actual soil of Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel. Produce grown in the state of Israel that's not part of the land of Israel in Second Temple times, according to those borders, for example, the Negev, the Arava, Eilat, some say the Golan, is also not subject to the laws of Shemitah. The Orthodox Union recommends being very careful before port purchasing wine uh, in the years to come. It comes from this year, 5,782, even with the Otsar Beit Din, because we're not allowed to waste or discard even a drop of that wine. We're not allowed to dispose of it once it becomes undrinkable. Okay, for all these restrictions and cautions, let's talk about the positive side. What can we do? Well, each Shemitah year offers us a tremendous opportunity to support religious farmers in Israel who are letting their fields rest during this Shemitah year. We can pitch in and help them by supporting them. Mizrahi, religious Zionists of Canada, are part of a global religious Zionist campaign to support observant farmers this year. You can feel free to send a donation directly to them via mizrahi.org slash shmita, shmita, S-H-E-M-I-T-T-A. Uh, and they will issue a Canadian tax receipt for all uh, donations. You can send it to the shul if you like. We'll send it along. We'll be happy to facilitate that. Uh, they have an Adopt-A-Farmer program. For $10,000 U.S., they will support a uh, family for the year. I believe we did this last time around. There's no, we, no reason we can't support several families in Israel for this year as they observe this eternal mitzvah. Now you say, great, I'm in, I'll support, but it's not enough. I want not just to support Israelis keeping Shemitah, I want to keep the sabbatical year myself. Are you in luck? For varying amounts of donation, you can buy 
for the year, either one square ama, about 18 inches by 18 inches, or a patch of land in Israel, four amot by four amot, dalad amas al dalad amas. You'll own it, and you can let it lie fallow this Shemitah year. What an opportunity. Check that website that I mentioned for details. It's also in the uh, email from before Rosh Hashanah. The mitzvahs of this week's Parsha that we mentioned have the element of personal responsibility and collective identity. In the mitzvah of writing a Torah, and the mitzvah of hakel coming together. So please, God, may this new year bring us God's gifts of strength, resolve, and positive outlook to enable us to do both with a full heart, take a greater share in personal identity, and also to gather together for good purposes in good health and in joy. Yomar Chatimatova, a happy and sweet year, and Shabbat Shalom.